Welcome back. Well, the world didn't stop turning while we've been off the air over Christmas, and this week we're back in business with two issues likely to stay on our political agenda for the rest of the year. The cannabis IQ controversy and Fiji's rough ride back to democracy. For most of last year, it looked like Fiji was making progress with preparations for an election next year. An election that would see the end of the interim government that's been ruling the country since the military coup back in 2006. A special independent commission presented its recommendations on a new constitution to the country's president two days before Christmas. But 24 hours later, Fiji police moved in and seized all copies of the document before it could leave the government printers. The president claimed the draft constitution neglected many of the fundamental principles of true democratic representation. He's asked his prime minister, Commodore Banamarama, to produce a new one. And last week, Fiji's interim government followed up with another decree. It bans trade union officials, members of the Employers' Federation, public servants, members of the judiciary, the military and the police from acting as party officials or being in the minimum of 5,000 members required for a party to qualify for the election. Well, that's a short headline summary, but to probe beyond the headlines, we're being joined now by the director of the Pacific Media Center, Professor David Roby. David Roby, thanks for joining us. Now, it obviously ended in tears, but how did the Constitution Commission start off? Well, in the early days, uh, it actually started off reasonably amicably and uh, for, for good reason, because uh, the head of the um, uh, Constitutional Commission was uh, Professor Yashkai, uh, who was known to the Attorney General uh, as um, Saeed Kaum. Uh, knew him for quite some time actually and at one stage um, uh, uh, Yashkai had actually sort of supervised um, my uh, master's thesis, you know, so there's a long-standing uh, rapport, if you like, between them. Uh, so in those early days, it uh, seemed to be a good choice uh, that um, Professor Guy had good respect around, uh, around the traps and um, uh, he was expected to come up with a really good um, constitution draft. Well, it, it seemed to go to clay very quickly because as soon as the decree was published, setting out the terms of reference for this uh, commission, Professor, Professor Guy was critical. Yes, well, uh, he, he, he uh, had uh, uh, quite a number of uh, reservations in the, in the process um, and he had uh, fairly unanimous uh, uh, support uh, from his fellow uh, commissioners. What was he objecting um, to? Well, basically, uh, I don't think he felt that he had enough, uh, enough of a free hand uh, and there wasn't uh, enough grounds for uh, consultation uh, generally. And he uh, felt quite strongly that he could actually sort of address this and, uh, and uh, improve things. Uh, but probably the sticking point came uh, with um, uh, the appointment of uh, Ratuchoni uh, Mundariwi, uh, who was the former vice president uh, and opponent of uh, the regime right from the time of the coup in 2006. No, no, I understand that Ratuchoni is known. He was an actually employed as a consultant by the commission, and yet he'd been politically active. Now, wasn't there a rule saying you can't do that? Well, essentially, essentially, that wasn't supposed to happen. Mm. Um, and but uh, I think from the regime's point of view, they were not consulted about this, and it was sort of done rather secretly. And so they were most unhappy with um, uh, Professor Guy uh, about that. And uh, and in the, in the end, uh, you know, it sort of the, the relationship spiraled downhill fairly rapidly from then on. Wasn't there another issue? Wasn't a, a, a requirement? that the commission actually grant immunity to a number of people, including the uh, Prime Minister of, of Fiji, uh, for taking part in coup. Essentially, that's the bottom line. Uh, I mean, uh, the Bainam Ram and his, um, uh, his fellow um, uh, coup leaders and so on have to have an ex exit clause. And so this is essential, the bottom line for them, that uh, to ensure that they actually have immunity, otherwise retain control. Um, and that sort of unfolded in, in, in a sense. Uh, I think that that was another point of uh, the, um, the regime felt that there's a breach of faith not only with Ratu uh, Joni, but, uh, but the final draft constitution didn't explicitly um, uh, you know, have uh, this um, immunity. I'll come back to it in a moment, but, um, but what was known was that the, that was one of the particular terms that the commission itself took exception to. And our foreign minister was in Fiji last July was he aware that there were these concerns when he announced that New Zealand was contributing half a million dollars 
to get this constitution drafted? Oh, I think he's fairly aware that there were, there were hiccups, but uh, probably uh, they considered that hiccups could be certainly resolved. Uh, but in the longer run, they never were. The, 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 just, the situation just spiralled uh, and got worse and worse. Uh, and of course, it's just equally important uh, for Australia too to put in a million uh, dollars into this whole process. Okay, but I mean, were, were the Commission's initial concerns addressed uh, before New Zealand, Australia and Fiji were announcing that we were going to ex exchange high commissioners, resume diplomatic relations, and, and have a relaxation of the travel sanctions I, I don't on think those satisfactorily. associated with I don't think they were resolved satisfactorily, but, but in, in a sense there was a separate process involved. Mm. The, the tripartite uh, sort of negotiations and agreements that were reached about uh, the exchange uh, of uh, high commissioners uh, and so on were based around the process that was going ahead with the uh, commission. Uh, in the fact that uh, the Commission, uh, there were reservations already um, emerging within the Commission's uh, process, uh, didn't really directly come into that. Okay, just after that announcement, we, we heard that uh, Fiji's last elected uh, Prime Minister was sentenced to jail for corruption. Was that expected? Oh, I think the, I think it was fairly widely expected for quite some quite some time. Of course, uh, there there are there is a view that uh, the process was actually a political uh, vendetta in a sense against uh, Ngarasi. Um, Lassen Ngarasi was a former banker before he became uh, prime minister, and he was uh, sent, he was sentenced for, to a year uh, imprisonment uh, for corruption uh, during uh, the period when he was on the board of uh, Fijian Holdings. Uh, and so that was seen as rather uh, vindictive uh, because it was so far ahead of uh, the time that he became Prime Minister. However, he's also facing, uh, I understand, f further, further charges um, of corruption during the period as Prime Minister and he would be facing those next month. Well, he was leader of one political party. Are there any other political parties whose leaders also face charges? Well, um, to be... Definitely, Frank, uh, right through that last democratic um, government uh, of Ngarasi, I mean, it's an open secret, the, the allegations of corruption uh, for a long time before the coup happened in 2006. Mm -hmm. But of course, that, that, those sorts of uh, taints, those sorts of allegations have been against a number of uh, uh, political leaders as well. But the, the thing is that the SDL uh, is, is, of course, uh, the uh, party that uh, pushed the uh, um, indigenous paramountcy under that last elected uh, process that led to the, the coup. Yes, the old being um, Karasai's party. But the Fiji Labour Party, uh, 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 for, you know, th there's also allegations about the leadership mm. there with, uh, 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 with Mahinda Chaudhary. Okay, the, the um, Karasai, of course, is associated with um, Ratu Johnny Matra Iwi. Now, how close was that association? Well, I'm not was sure that, that there's that really, a really uh, that an association so much as that uh, when, he, when um, uh, Raju Joni was uh, vice president, um, he, uh, of course, was very opposed to the, uh, the coup. Mm -hmm. But that was on, on principal grounds uh, mm -hmm. as a prominent lawyer and, uh, and uh, a judge uh, before he became um, uh, vice president. Uh, he felt uh, from a legal perspective there's no way that he can possibly support uh, a legal uh, usurpation of the democratic government. So, so that was a principled uh, stand uh, that, that he took, rather than any particular um, association between him and Ngarasi or Ngarasi's government. Well, as you uh, pointed, but uh, I think you know uh, that's what's happened since then, and uh, this was complicated the uh, constitutional commission's um, process because Rajiv uh, Johnny was involved with an SDL uh, submission to the Constitutional Commission that uh, advocated um, uh, essentially um, indigenous uh, paramountcy. Um, and so that would so seem... So there he very... was as a consultant to the Commission, a paid consultant to the Commission, and as a submitter to the Commission. Yes. Well, wasn't this position compromised? Uh, oh, but I, I think ma many would uh, argue that that was the case, and certainly the regime uh, took, that, took that view. Yeah. Uh, and that probably, uh, in many respects, that probably was the uh, really damaging, uh, you know, sort of uh, event that really under the good work of the uh, Commission overall. Yes, because at that point, I think there was another decree issued and they actually changed the terms of reference for the Commission and the Constituent Assembly, which would deal with the Commission's recommendations. Uh, what was the impact of that? Well, the impact was uh, really set up um, the uh, the process that uh, would inevitably mean that the uh, draft um, constitution was going to fail. 
um, the regime uh, have taken the, the view that uh, they weren't going to get what they wanted, and so they obviously planned ahead before um, the draft uh, document came out um, and to uh, produce something of their own. Effectively, the, uh, the chairman of the commission, Professor Guy, has said that this will lock out any further public hearings on either the constitution with the constitutional commission or the constituent uh, assembly, which has yet to actually even be named. Yes. Is that the case? And that's, that's pretty well the case. It's, it's hard to see that there's going to be any real genuine public consultation. About what time would you imagine that the Fijian government would think this is going to cause a hell of a stink? This isn't what most people would be expecting as we try and manoeuvre our way towards uh, an election and democracy? No, no, no. But then uh, this is the track record of the regime. Uh, they've never really taken into account seriously what the rest of the world think, uh, thinks, particularly Australia and uh, New Zealand. The bottom line is to have um, a uh, constitution that is going to see the end of the old political era, the, the, the party-based system that uh, was, was essentially a failure from mm. independence. Yes, and of course uh, last week we saw yet another decree issued and this one uh, regulates the conduct of political parties. Now how does this decree look in terms of its international acceptability? Well, the I number think, of people I have been banned from from participating uh, <laughs> in political life. Yes, it's hard to see how any genuine political process can take place um, uh, with such a draconian uh, arrangement uh, for, for parties. Uh, and it's clearly aimed at uh, Ngarasi's party, SDL. But ironically, uh, that is the party that's probably the best, um, uh, well, certainly in the best position to, to deal uh, with this new decree. And of course, they've only got until the end of uh, next month uh, for all parties, uh, and there are 16 parties in the uh, political framework in uh, Fiji, but for all these parties to re-register and they have to find 5,000 members uh, in this uh, one month period. Uh, and of course they've barred, uh, you know, uh, people who are... Yes, well, uh, trade unionists, trainers. militia, police, correction service officers, trade unionists, and members of the Employers' Federation. And any members of the party in the past that have had, um, um, you know, uh, been in jail in, in the last... Um, uh, With you know, the grand exemptions months. of the President and the Prime Minister. Exactly, exactly. But it's clearly aimed against the Nkarasi. They, they want Nkarasi entirely out of uh, the political framework and it probably means that could be the end of... Uh, uh, of uh, the Fiji Labour Party in its present form. See, I mean, uh, probably the scenarios that could develop out of this uh, would mean that um, uh, possibly two or three of the largest parties may be able to uh, meet the deadline and uh, the frameworks. Other parties might have to sort of uh, slip beyond the registration period and then look for regrouping. Um, or we end up with the um, United Opposition um, uh, framework uh, across all parties, which seems to be what's happening now. So how do you see the situation developing from here, particularly given the interest that both China and the United States are now taking in Pacific Affairs? Well, it's very interesting that the last couple of years uh, we've seen the US particularly take uh, an interest in the Pacific in response to China's uh, growing influence uh, in the region generally, but particularly in uh, Fiji. Uh, the last uh, two forums, uh, the Pacific Islands forums meeting in Auckland uh, the year before last, uh, and then uh, last year in the Cook Islands, uh, both China and, uh, and uh, the US had huge delegations of about 50 members in each, both for both of those years. And then, of course, we had uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who went to the Cook Islands last year. So there's clearly there's a, there's a repositioning and rivalry uh, there. Uh, but one of the things uh, that's not really considered terribly well, I think, uh, within um, uh, political frameworks in Australia and New Zealand is that that whole role that not only China but also India play because both of those countries have um, really been sympathetic at the least uh, if not uh, possibly undermining but for Australia and New Zealand's position anyway and yet they haven't really been consulted. You know listening to all the, the track record of events dating back to July last year and looking at what we've seen in the mainstream media of New Zealand just how well served do you think we've been? 
Oh, very poorly served. Uh, I mean, the situation is very, very complex. Uh, it, it, on the one hand, it seems very straightforward. We've got a military regime. We've got to, we've got to rid out, uh, get rid of this military regime or military-backed regime and get uh, back to democracy as soon as possible. But the, the, the political configurations in Fiji are quite, uh, quite complex. And without a systematic and comprehensive coverage of the um, developments in Fiji and the rest of the Pacific, our, our public are not going to be terribly well informed and it also it's not going to feed into public policy terribly well. And so with a few notable rare exceptions like Radio New Zealand International and uh, a, a few individual journalists, um, there's hardly any coverage at all and really the coverage only comes when uh, the crisis in, in the region and in Fiji blow up every so on and unfortunately we don't get enough about the background. Is this crisis time? I th well, I think it's an ongoing, it's certainly the ongoing uh, crisis. Um, but I, what part of the reason I think that the media coverage needs to be a lot more comprehensive and, uh, and more in depth is we have to understand the nature of the beast and why, why the regime is uh, acting the way it is and what it's, what it's uh, um, trying to do. Because unless we understand the bottom line of what they're going to achieve or to hope to achieve, what they claim is that um, it's the first time that uh, Fiji will have a d genuine democracy. One person, one vote, and doing away with um, you know race-based politics, which has marred uh, Fiji, the political scene ever since independence. But it's, it's a bizarre way of going about it. If that's, that's what they claim, and on the other hand, uh, every step and every block on the way is anti-democratic. Professor Roby, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor David Roby, director of the Pacific Media Centre. And coming up, does early cannabis use damage your IQ? Well, do young teenagers using cannabis run the risk of stunting their intelligence? Yes, say the authors of a Dunedin study based on data from a group they've been tracking for the last 40 years from their birth. And no, says a Norwegian analyst who's built a statistical model that demonstrates that poverty can have exactly the same impact. So who's right? Or could both be right? To find out, we're talking to an analyst who's been looking at both those studies. He's Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Auckland, Thomas Lumley. Professor Lumley, thanks for joining us. Look, have either of these studies actually established or disproved a direct link between early cannabis use and deterioration in IQ? I think a direct link might be too strong. So the Dunedin study provided better evidence than we'd had before to suggest that uh, the association between lower IQ and cannabis use was actually a result of cannabis, but it's by no means conclusive. Okay. And the Norwegian study um, reduced, suggested that it was uh, even less conclusive than the Dunedin authors yes. thought. Yes, and, and suggested as an alternative that socioeconomic factors, and, and really specifically poverty, could be more of a fact. Yes, that's right. So um, the Norwegian econ economist, Dr. Rogerberg, uh, suggested that what happens is that people in lower socioeconomic groups who have jobs and recreational activities that look less like IQ tests um, tend to do wor relatively worse on IQ tests as they get older and so you get this sort of decline. Is there any uh, truth in that? There's some evidence for this. The model that he was using is partly due to um, Flynn, who's a famous New Zealand researcher in this mm -hmm. area and who's been interested in the environmental effects. And basically, IQ tests seem to be like anything else. If you practice if you them, you get better. Them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And if your daily life Equally. includes things that look like it, yes. Right. I'd like to, to um, focus on the Dunedin study, yep. which you suggest actually does give a stronger indication of a linkage. That is a, a, it, we, we've got a, a, a database study that, based on information gathered from just over 1,000 people who've been tracked since birth in Dunedin 40 years ago. Now, how safe is it to generalise from the base of data gathered from one group of people born at the same time in the same place. Yes. Well, that it depends a bit on what's really well, what, the, what the explanation <laughs> really is. So, if the explanation is really 
sort of biochemical, that cannabis is doing something to your brain cells, then presumably it would do something to your brain cells even if you lived somewhere with nice weather. And so it wouldn't be specific to Dunedin. But if it's a cultural or sociological phenomenon, uh, then it would, it would be different in different places. It might be fairly similar across New Zealand, but it might be very different in, say, you know, Arabia or uh, North America or somewhere. Okay, but, but just how good is that, uh, that tracking of, of that group over a period of 40 years? Now, I know a lot of people, I come from Dunedin, yeah. and a lot of people I know left Dunedin as soon as they could. Well, uh, yeah. people shift, people yeah. change, people they do. do different things. And that's one of the difficult things about running a cohort study. Is it but a good the, one? The Dunedin cohort study is really extremely good. Yeah. And so at their 38 year old follow up, they got 96% of the living people back, which mm -hmm. is outstanding. And so um, they've really got very good data on these 1,000 people, uh, and they're bringing them, currently starting to bring them back again for another visit. Okay, I mean, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see what the aging effects are, because yes. uh, it's going to be the first time we've seen that mm -hmm. tracked mm -hmm. over time. But about 5% of that study group, I understand, were considered to have been cannabis dependent or, or had used the drug more than once a week before the age of 18. How does that compare to what we know about cannabis use among young New Zealanders generally? Well, I don't know how it compares to 40 years ago, which is when, yes. uh, or 30 years ago, which is when it was taken. It's not far off what the surveys are suggesting now, so that the all ages proportion is about 6%. and it's a bit higher, cannabis use generally is a bit higher in younger people. So 5% may be a bit low, but not very low compared to the population okay. now. Over the period between 18 and, and 38, mm. uh, the, these uh, young Dunedinites um, showed an average, I think, of 8%, 8 point deterioration in their IQs. Mm. Wouldn't a lot of other people have done exactly the same thing? Well, this was a difference relative to the people ah, who didn't smoke cannabis. Okay. So um, IQ tests are ideally are standardized so that they don't change with age, at least at younger mm -hmm. ages. But uh, yes, it's the difference between the, the regular heavy cannabis users and the rest that makes this interesting. Let me turn now to the, to the Norwegian study by Dr. Rogerberg. Uh, what, what do you know about? I mean, have you had a chance to really look at his study too? I've looked at his paper and what he did was basically, he said that they hadn't addressed specifically socioeconomic status in the original mm -hmm. uh, Dunedin publication, but that from general principles and from some other papers from the Dunedin group, you'd expect that cannabis use would be higher at lower socioeconomic status, and that there was independent reason to believe that you'd get uh, an, a greater decline in IQ in people of lower socioeconomic status. And so that that would be an alternative explanation mm -hmm. for what was reported. Well, you don't agree with them, do you? Well, I agree that it was a plausible explanation. <laughs> yes, and but, it was. I mean, but in terms of but cr it, a critique of this particular survey. Well, as a critique of the survey, I think it, he was quite right that the original Dunedin research didn't take this into account, mm -hmm. and it could have been an alternative explanation of what they found. Mm -hmm. After his paper came out, the Dunedin group did some more analyses, and those analyses suggest that while this could have been the explanation, it actually wasn't. So, so how, how did how so was that demonstrated? So what they did was, so they did various, they did a number of analyses trying to statistically control for socioeconomic status. The simplest one, and in some ways the most dramatic one, is they just restricted the data to people whose parents had particular group of what they described as middle class occupations. Mm -hmm. And then saying that among that group, there's not a whole lot of variation in socioeconomic status. So that couldn't be the explanation. OK, well, how did uh, Dr. Rogerberg's simulation actually come up that there was such a socioeconomic link? So he work? used, so he wasn't saying that there definitely was. He was saying, what would it take? What would the relationship have to be in order to explain what they saw in the study? So we know that in general you'd expect more cannabis use at lower socioeconomic status and that Dunedin's in fact reported this and that you'd also expect 
this um, relative decrease in IQ. And if you put together the numbers that you'd expect over, over a plausible range of those numbers, um, the association that you'd see that was really due to a socioeconomic status would be about the same as what they saw in the Dunedin paper. So he, he, in his analyses, it didn't explain all the um, mm -hmm. decrease. But it explained quite a lot of it, and it added a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so and he specifically said that his results didn't discredit mm -hmm. the uh, Dunedin analysis, mm -hmm. but they did suggest that that this that it was less conclusive than the authors had claimed. Well, you're a biased statistician. Tell me this in an unbiased fashion. If you had to choose between a study uh, that involved a statistical simulation, if you like. Uh, if you had to, had to look at that, and then look at one using actual data from actual people, which approach would be more likely to produce an accurate result? Well, it depends on how well you can <laughs> measure the thing. So yes. if you're talking about something you can't measure well, then you may get a more reliable idea by saying, OK, what values of this are plausible and doing a simulation, rather than treating the things you measure as if they're exactly right. So. For example, if you ask people how much alcohol they drink and you measure how much alcohol is sold in stores, there's a huge gap. Mm -hmm. So we know that asking people how much they alcohol lie. they drink, they lie. Okay. Or they have failures <laughs> of recall or whatever. And isn't it and likely that perhaps the people who said they didn't smoke cannabis might have lied? It's possible. Uh, in this and case... And therefore there'd be a bigger variation. In, in, um, that's, that's a possible explanation as well. That You'd normally expect that to make the effect go away rather mm. than make you oh, see okay. an effect. Mm. Um, what you'd need is a sort of complicated pattern where people at low socioeconomic status with higher IQ lied more. Which is possible, but it's you know that would be another possible explanation. Okay. Are there any other studies that show links between other forms of substance abuse, such as tobacco or alcohol, or other environmental factors, or even variations in individual diet and fitness, and IQ deterioration? Uh, I don't think there are for tobacco. For alcohol, um, prolonged heavy alcohol use is known to cause certain types of brain damage mm -hmm. and mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an expert on this area, but there's, for example, something called Korsakoff psychosis. I know, I just thought you might have yeah. observed um, it uh, yeah. as you reviewed various yes. biostatistical analysis. Um, and there's <coughs> lots of suggestions that diet um, might prevent um, loss of memory and loss of cognitive function in old age, mm. the data isn't wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. the data on diet is very hard to collect well. Now, final point. You, you are quoted as saying that uh, the whole analysis is not relevant to public policy because no one's suggesting that cannabis should be legal under 18. Well, and, uh, yeah. why, do you, why do you say that? that I mean, that's that, an and that, it's an and is that correct? It's an exaggeration, I think, that there are, but I think the serious proposals for decriminalization or legalization would mostly <coughs> treat it like alcohol and have a minimum age. I would have thought there was one thing that would have had an impact on public policy, and that is that the result could guide you on how to target more effectively a campaign yes. to make people aware of yes. the danger. Yes, and I think that this result would be, uh, provided that you don't go too far in overstating its certainty, that it would be quite a good thing to include in health promotion messages. I don't think it's going to be very important in decisions about legalization or decriminalization, though. Do you think it would be convincing? Um, well, the question let, is whether it's clear about to it. teenagers. A lot of people, that's the point. Yes, and um, I, it may well not be. I mean, this is, health promotion is a sort of specialised subfield of marketing as well as of health research. And I don't know whether it could be framed in a way that would be convincing. But I, if it could be, then I think the level of evidence is sufficient that it would be ethical to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thomas Lumley, Professor of Biostatistics at Auckland University. And that's it for now. We'll be back in a week with more of our nation's newsmakers on the beats and interview. Till then, thanks for your company.
supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.